I'm going to show you the game between Ding Liren and Anish Giri from round five of the Sinkfield Cup. This game was quite simply a strategic masterpiece. Without further ado, let's take a look what happened. So Ding with the white pieces and he is very well versed in his openings. Well, both players are, of course. Both players solidly in the top 10 in the world. Ding, of course, rated number three in the world. Um, both very ambitious, trying to get to the very top. Ding, 26 years old, and Anish Giri, 25 years old. So, yeah, we can make a direct comparison between the two of them. So, it's a Ragazin, a very solid line uh, for, for both players, really. So the point of playing the queen to a4 check was to drag the knight to, a, to c6 to protect the bishop. And that means the c pawn is blocked. And that means it's a little bit more difficult to attack white center because the c pawn normally comes out to c5. But there are ways around this. Um, so rook d8 plays here. Queen g6 is another important move there. And Ding previously has played a3 in this position, but today he went bishop e2. And now, as the bishop has come out here, black takes on c4. And here, previously, we've seen bishop d7 played. Um, I remember a game between David Navarra and Peter Leko that from Beal uh, in 2017, two years ago, where they had this position, but Leko never really managed to break out behind the first three ranks, and Navarro won a beautiful game with eventually controlling the centre and with the kingside attack. This is the danger in this position. But instead of that, Giri took on c3. And then bishop d7. So there's some kind of discovered attack threatened here on the bishop. So the bishop dropped back. And now Giri takes the chance to expand in the center. So now again there's a threat here that's discovered. So the queen drops back, which looks very modest. And now here is after 15 moves, a very important moment in the game, actually. Black has to decide how to set up for the middle game. What kind of pawn structure do you want? And one crucial question is, do you leave this pawn on e5? Do you exchange here, or do you push forward? And I can see from the clock times that Giri thought for 17 minutes in this position. He was obviously a little bit unsure, and I can understand that. If the pawns are exchanged on d4, then this gives white a beautiful center. Very hard to make any progress against that. And white's pieces are beautifully set up on the queen side to attack those pawns, or at least put pressure on those pawns. It's possible just to hold the position, let's just protect that pawn. But at some moment, black is going to have to decide what to do about that pawn. Obviously, white will just cast and bring the rook to the middle. And it's not easy to hold that tension in the middle of the board. So Geary, after this long think, played e4. So now the pawn structure is rather akin to a French defence, actually, with colours reversed where we have this solid pawn chain, normally it's f7, e6, d5 here, um, and there's this pawn on e4. Now very often in the French you can use that pawn here as a spearhead for an attack on the king's side, but obviously here black is lacking a few minor pieces, crucially that bishop, which would be on d6, does, simply doesn't exist in this position. So actually, white castles very safely and black can't really build up an attack. So that means there is potentially a problem with that pawn, actually. Obviously, it blocks the bishop at the moment, so that bishop on f5, not a beautiful piece. 
but Geary has done this because he can at least uh, put some pressure on this pawn so it's not possible for, for white to advance here, for example. And, and black's position at the moment looks absolutely fine. But in fact, there is a kind of solidity to white's pawn structure, which is very powerful, actually, uh, as we'll see. Um, over the next few moves, it might be possible for black to play b6, and I'll explain why that could be important in a moment. So the knight comes around to f1. So black seems to have set up very nicely, but actually it's very difficult to make any more progress for black in this position. King side, well, nothing's happening on the king side. White is absolutely solid here uh, with these minor pieces there as well. On the queen side, well, if black takes here, then white is just going to recapture and nothing really doing there. So, yeah, hard for black here, but white can improve the position slightly. Now, here is another moment where b6 might be possible. But Giri played queen g5. Now, I guess he's perhaps looking to do this on a good day to force the knight away and perhaps get a little bit of pressure on the king side. But queen b1 is an excellent move, attacking the e-pawn. And Giri advanced the f-pawn, which looks all very fine, actually. But this creates long-term weaknesses. This isn't really an, atta an attacking move. It's an very rare that black will be able to force through f4 and actually as is so often the case you know we have to think about this open diagonal and the weakness of the second rank once that pawn has moved from f7 i go on about this a lot in my videos um in fact we only need to look back to the the game between Caruana and Aronian from uh, from yesterday to see what happens when well both sides advance their f pawn in that game uh, uh, with yeah potentially you know fatal consequences. Okay, let's see what happens here. Now this next move, excellent move from Ding. Pawn takes pawn. Rook takes pawn. Now, first glance, you think this looks very strange to give up this important point in the middle of the board, and particularly when there's, you know, it exposes an isolated pawn here. But this is excellent strategy because that rook sits beautifully on d4. If there's an exchange, then the pawn structure is fine again, and in this kind of position, well, black has to be very careful because that queen is looking to invade here, and the knight looks very wobbly on a5. Um, you can see that, that white has this wonderful mass of pawns and pieces in the, in the center of the board, but black, well, I think every picture tells a story, black is split between two sides and the combination of loose pieces on the queen side plus a weakened king along here and along here. This is actually quite an unpleasant position for black. Okay, let's go back. Let me see. So that's the position rook d4 just played. Bishop f7, very understandable to cover this diagonal. Still doesn't look bad at all for black. But let's see, rook d1, hmm. This is uh, starting to look ominous for black. Again, it's possible to exchange here. But once the pawn structure is straightened out, then this is tricky. 
If the rook goes back here, then the queen starts to invade. And that's rather nasty. You know, that pawn is vulnerable. Well, all kinds of um, pieces are vulnerable here. Or if the rook goes to d5, then white will switch to the c file himself. And, and the rook is kind of looking pretty useless on d5, just biting against the rock on d4. So after white has doubled on the d-file, then the rook steps aside. But now, of course, ding controls the d-file. And this is very, very difficult for black. Even though, you know, you'd think there's potential to, to attack this pawn if, if black can win this pawn all very well. But actually, ding has judged this position superbly. And he's appreciated that, in fact, black is in massive trouble here. This pawn is a weakness, and when that's protected, then black is exposed on the first and second ranks. So this next move is beautiful. Really great move. Bishop b5. So a couple of things. Well, the bishop might well come into d7, attacking the rook and the pawn here. It also prevents the knight coming back to c6, because it could be that that will simply be exchanged off, and then the rooks will invade. Um, well, first of all, let's see what happens if that pawn on c3 is taken. Then, in fact, bishop d7 is just very powerful, hitting the rook. And once this one, the f pawn goes, then, of course, the e pawn goes. If a6 then that's a, a nice deflection. If, pawn, if the pawn is taken, then the bishop comes in and this pawn will drop again. And if the queen drops back, then let's go in. And then you can see how dangerous this is with the rooks invading. And again, once that one drops, this one drops and that's fatal. My computer thinks that rook c7 is a possible defense, but I can understand why Geary would be very reluctant to play a move like that because it allows the rooks to invade. How comfortable would you feel if your opponent had suddenly doubled the rooks like this, hassling the king? Well, you might be able to defend if you're made of silicon, but for a human, that is looks very nasty. Well, Geary played a very understandable human move, g6, to cover this pawn on f5, which is, of course, you know, the, the problem in so many of these variations. Okay, the knight's job is done. And it hops back to cover this, and it will shortly be coming in here. And now the bishop's just, the bishop switches back to b3, excellent move. So Giri at least manages to exchange off that knight on a5, which wasn't doing too much. But this pawn structure is very helpful for white. Um, as we'll see, this b pawn can support the c pawn advancing. Giri in massive trouble here. These rooks can't do anything, biting on that pawn. But Ding always has potential with his double rooks, and particularly when black's king lacks cover. You know, this king needs to be somewhere up the board on h6. Uh, not so easy to get it there, and even then it wouldn't be completely secure. So I think understandably, uh, Geary plays here b5 to try and get his rooks back in the game. He needs counterplay desperately. Um, if, for example, if, if black waits with king g7, then the knight hops in here. And this is a very simple strategy. Well, if, if the queen comes back, then rook can come to d6. And if the queen comes here, then rook d7 check. This is actually very, very nasty. So b5, looking for counterplay. Knight d5, excellent move. This 
relies on calculation now. It's, you know, we, we can talk in general terms about controlling an open file and, you know, improving your pawn structure, but actually at some moment you have to calculate precisely. So once again, this is very, very pleasant for white, having knocked out a defender of the king and the rooks will invade. So the rook steps up and now c5, excellent move. And again, this is all about shutting out black's rooks. So if that's taken, Ding has spotted that he can play this, attacking a rook, and knight d7, forking queen and rook and winning exchange, and that's game over. So c5 just played. So Giri plays a5, hoping to, to you know, isolate that pawn, maybe playing b4. Another excellent move from Ding, and this is good judgment, because at first you'd think, well, this looks a bit funny to, to give your opponent the chance to create a, a protected pass pawn on a4. a4 didn't happen, but let me just show you what could occur after that. So knight c3, hitting this one. If the bishop comes to a4, we've, we've got a trick. We can take this pawn. So rook b8 to defend that pawn. And now the rooks invade. And then knight d5. Uh, this is just horrible. You know, if this is taken, then the rooks come in. Eventually that queen is going to find its way in via one of these diagonals, uh, depending on where black's queen goes. Uh, there is simply no defense to the king when the second rank and the first rank, and indeed this rank here, they're all open. This is the problem. There are no pawns to shut out the rooks. Just compare with white's king. That's the story of this game. White's king completely safe, black's king exposed. Okay, so b4 has just been played. Giri took this. He's still trying to find counterplay, taking this pawn. But now, potentially, this one is a problem. Rook b8 defends the pawn. Knight b6 coming in again. Uh, if this is taken, then I'm sure you can see it ends up in a knight fork on d7. So bishop e6. And the knight comes in. Forking again. So that forces the exchange. And a nice little intermezzo before taking this bishop. And only then. So it just gains a little bit of time. So Ding has given up his pawn on c5, but he's managed to get his rook to the seventh rank. And this is absolutely fatal because that rook cannot be challenged. A check. So he wants to bring his queen in here. So that has to be blocked. Queen b2, threatening mate. So that has to be blocked. Queen a2, excellent. So that has to be blocked again. But now the queen has potential to come down to a7. So yeah, if queen c4, then the queen comes down, threatening rook g7 check, threatening rook d8 and mate. Uh, so horrendous. Rook c4 played. Um, queen a7 is, is actually still a good move. But g3, that is such a cool move. He's just setting up rook d6 and just clearing up the back rank problem before he goes any further. Such a cool idea. And you can see there is no real defense here. So that rook is pinned. That can't come back. Uh, rook c6 uh, will land in big trouble because then the first rank is exposed um, and well, queen a8, for example. Oh no, excuse me. <laughs> Rook c6 can just be taken, of course. <laughs> yeah, that solves that problem uh, because of the pin. So king f8 played, escaping the pin. Uh, but Rook g6, I mean, there was, there was simply no defense to this. And... Starts to, 
to clean up. Um, and basically, he's he's getting ready to to move the queen into the action, and then this is going to be fatal. Basically, um, once the queen has to remain here. Well, Geary gave up this pawn. This was simply taken. It doesn't make any difference. The fact that the G file is open, Black can't use that. Um, and here, uh, Anish Geary resigned. Well, let's just take it a little bit further. What what happens if? I mean, Black Black is is so short of moves here. The the rook can't move uh, because that would allow the queen in. Uh, this rook can't move from the first rank. Okay, let's let's try King E8. So Queen A7. Let's move the queen in finally, threatening some kind of devastation here. So let's block, take. Queen takes the queen shuts. Uh, just cuts back, threat, rook h8. Finally, the queen enters the game, and, and that really is fatal. And just check out the king positions. Again, that's the story. White's king has cover, black's doesn't. Brilliant, brilliant game from Ding, who understood the, the strategic subtleties of this position so well. And I have to say, I think Anish Giri was completely outplayed there. So Ding joins the leaders, so we now have um, Vichy Anand, Fabiano Caruana and Ding Liren uh, on plus one in the lead. After five games we've got a free day and then the remaining four games of the tournament to come. Remember if you want to subscribe to the channel then do click on the button below, free to subscribe of course. And if you want to support the channel, do check out the links to PayPal and Patreon.com in the video descriptions. And do check out all the other playlists available. We've got over a thousand videos on this channel and there's some interesting stuff there. Thanks for watching.